Right, welcome everybody. Uh, before we get stuck into this, um, just want to put a shout out for uh, anybody that's based in Barcelona um, to come to the Web3 family events on every Wednesday at Say Something Gallery. And uh, it's, sometimes it's privacy focused, sometimes it's more about uh, governance and that kind of thing, but um, yeah. And uh, I'm joined by these uh, uncommonly attractive people today to talk about privacy in Web3. It's often um, overlooked and we talk about this trilemma of decentralization, security um, and scalability, but nobody's really until now solving the problems of privacy. So, uh, so yeah. Um, guys, you want to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit how, how you're solving this problem? All right, I can uh, start from my side. My name is Oscar Ipsis. I'm a co-founder at Alter Network. We've been developing safe uh, and private communication platform on Secret Network. So we're using programmable smart contracts there. As well, we are giving uh, our end user the so-called encryption key uh, to generate on their device, as well to decrypt and encrypt uh, everything on their device so nothing is passing through our network and also our servers. So basically everything that is being done on our platform is also completely private. We don't ask any information about your personal details so you can be completely anonymous. Um, our website also doesn't use any kind of like trackers, cookies, so if you really want to have anonymous messaging and also uh, protocol to use for your also team and productivity to replace Slack, it's also possible. Um, that's about myself. Hello everyone, can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so my name is Jaya and I work for a project called NIM and I'm also severely jet lagged and it's the end of the day on Friday, so bear with me. I'll try and kind of be uh, as energetic as I possibly can. Um, so NIM is, uh, is a project that provides something called network layer privacy. Um, so if you kind of imagine the internet and you imagine data packets, you know, traveling all across the internet, those data packets, even when they're encrypted, are visible to see. So people, even, even though they can't, you know, some, an observer cannot look at the content of the actual data packets, the, uh, the patterns of communication reveals a lot in and of itself. Um, uh, in other words, the metadata of communication reveals, um, uh, in fact, many times more than the content itself, um, also because metadata is, uh, is very easy for machines to read, which means that machine learning driven uh, surveillance can make a lot out of uh, observing networks in this kind of a way. So what NIM uh, primarily provides is something called a mixnet, which takes those data packets, um, mixes them through three different uh, layers of mix nodes, um, and also kind of encrypts each packet uh, in several layers of something called a Sphinx encryption. So it makes all the data packets look exactly the same. So someone that's actually looking at all this kind of pattern of communication, you know, they just, they cannot suss out any, any patterns. Um, so yeah, what we provide is essentially network layer privacy um, across, you know, any type of application or wallet. Um, and we're kind of web two or web three agnostic in that sense. Thanks. Um, so hi, I'm Fraser, um, CEO of Checked, where we're building uh, basically payment infrastructure for a paradigm called self-sovereign ID, decentralized ID, self-managed ID, or last year buzzword came out, which was Web5. But the whole idea is individuals having control and ownership of their data. Um, and basically just, just having that utility, that portability. Um, and we're very focused on enabling payments, enabling the commercial side of that. So the organizations with data silos release that data to individuals instead of the status quo right now, as we heard on quite a few panels across these two days. Um, and the other side of things that we're working on now is decentralized reputation. So the idea that you don't necessarily need to know someone's identity in terms of like their passport or their name uh, or their driving license. What you really need to know about them is, can I trust this person within this interaction? And that's it. Um, and the final thing to say on, on Checked is, we're one of the 10 startups pitching at five or 10 past five. Um, so if you see me run off stage, it's because the bat signal's gone and I have to ditch the panel to go and pitch <laughs> downstairs and not go, the, not go through the service elevators because I found out they don't go downstairs, which, yeah, so it's a long way around. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> 
So, uh, so yeah, guys, um, why is why is privacy important in uh, in 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 blockchain? Why why does it matter? What's the I, give a shit factor? I think there's been like this historic. It's always been a bit of a wave that we've seen this time around. But like historically in crypto web three, like a lot of stuff has been put on ledger, like a lot. And I think people are starting to realize that that is not necessarily a good thing. Like, it's very, very easy to trace someone's behavior if you, you know their address. Like, the easiest thing I could kind of give as an, as an example is an example and an anecdote. Like, if you ever interact with someone and you find out someone's address, you can effectively watch their behavior across the network. Like, it's, it's a known thing in, in projects where people very quickly find out who the whales are, they find out who the exchanges are, the foundation, and they watch those addresses because it's all on Ledger. Um, and there's another anecdote which was, um, happened in the UK, I think, two um, NFTs were stolen from someone. And I think it was something like whoever stole them was using ENS, or at least they'd given some part of their identity away. And the police showed up at their front door. And in that situation, like the outcome is positive for the individuals involved, apart from the person caught. But like the implications for like putting that kind of stuff on chain and exposing that privacy that way is pretty terrifying if you get it wrong. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think uh, the irony here, obviously, is that the, a lot of the kind of early ideas around Web3 was, you know, in response to some of the problems that we were seeing in Web2, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, which includes, you know, centralization of both infrastructural control and, and value, um, but also overreach by, you know, nation states and, and corporations in terms of, you know, just how much they know about people. Um, and then ironically, we end up in a situation where we have public ledgers <laughs> where things are even more visible, not just to, you know, super powerful um, secret services or extremely powerful corporations, but, you know, a lot of other, a lot of other actors. So, you know, the question of privacy, um, I think most of us on the pan this panel will probably agree, is even more urgent when it comes to Web3, um, in fact. Just, uh, just one thing to kind of add on to what you said around nation states. I saw, whether it's true or not, a great tweet the other day was like, if you wanted to create a system as a government entity which was perfect for minimizing like money laundering or making it super traceable, Bitcoin. They were like, as soon as you know the addresses, you can just watch it move around and it's all out there in the open, which, yeah, I mean, it's pretty conspiracy theory in terms of where it's pitching from and you never know. But in terms of like the actual outcome of what you can do in terms of traceability is, is pretty wild. Um, from my side, actually, is that the most important thing is that we don't want to make the same mistake as in Web2, that we are giving our personal data as a user to large corporates like Facebook, Twitter. They're using the so-called activity tracking our so-called data, what we do on the platform as well, giving up our information that we insert of it, of course. So, and we are not getting any monetization on it. So I think also the privacy side on blockchain is uh, very well needed just to monetize your data as a user. So basically it's not for free. So all these public ledgers are very transparent and they're publicly available, right? But it doesn't give the so-called user the right to choose whether he wants to share it or not. Because I think the Web3 should be more peer-to-peer -peer and it should be giving more options as an end user, as an end client, rather than just focusing on user experience. Because again, we are doing the same stuff on Web2, now we want to do the same stuff on Web3. So how are we gonna incentivize users more to use your product? So. One of them is offering up a piece of part of your revenue, uh, but at the same time, your blockchain must be private from the public side. So people cannot monetize your data, like from analytical companies, because uh, when you see all those cookie settings and how many data companies are there, like it's, it's into hundreds. So if you want to, uh, especially more, more websites have like no possibilities to just decline all. So you have, go one by one and decline it in order to preserve your so-called trackability and what you do on the internet. So that's where I see privacy uh, with blockchain very well needed, plus it will incentivize to create more products. And definitely I see a lot of uh, uh, potential in privacy-based products with such monetization. <laughs> nice, so, uh, so tell me, what, probably everyone in the room is using Telegram, right, as their, their main uh, messenger app, I think, in this industry. It's quite 
It's like the, the go-to. Um, so why aren't we using something that's, that's private or secure? Or why do we use this, yeah. this crap solution? I mean, that's because it's very well organized and the user experience is quite too remarkable, I would say, except the spamming, of course, on Telegram. Like, when you meet people and you don't remember from conference with the PFP, like from NFT, uh, with the profile picture and username, well, it's, and then you kind of spam and all the groups, like that's, that's one of the big minus, but in general, it's really great to use experience, easy to use, easy sh to share. Uh, but again, those platforms don't, end, uh, don't use any end-to-end -end encryption. So that means uh, what, they're, what they're offering you is the free product, which is really nice to use and Basically, why it's for free? Because you're being monetized on your data. So what you type, what, what's your interest, what you're doing, they're, they're consuming that and selling. Of course, you don't care about it, right? You're just getting the product for that. But when it comes to more decision maker analysis, when it comes to more of like marketing, you'll always get what? Relative ads, relative things, which also makes, of course, convenience for us at the end. Uh, but uh, all these products don't uh, want to connect much more into Web3 space, which is like using smart contracts, using NFT gated access, which is of course like Board 8 Yacht Club, like good, good, good example with Discord. They, they got hacked and then basically the admin rights, everything was really bad and trustability into the organization is like decreasing. Like why should I then risk my uh, accessibility to this communication if, I, if, if you cannot preserve the security side? So. Um, and uh, Web3 is uh, offering more security side, like that's one of the biggest reasons why social platforms and communications uh, should be replacing in the nearest like two or three years definitely, um, because we are attaching so-called uh, potential data that cannot be changed. So we, either it's NFT, either it's unique token that will give you the access, and at the same time you're also preserving your uh, privacy when you're connecting to these uh, so-called platforms uh, because all these like telegram solution and signal they're still offering uh, to add your phone number and that's like interesting why well, still need phone number if you're saying that you're private you're end-to-end -end encrypted but you're still requesting some kind of like data that is actually being used for my side so uh, but the most important thing is that involvement uh, adding more extra features that make sense to use like in-app payments between the users to split the bill. Um, I like the always the utility of WeChat, but I don't like their uh, approach when it comes to data, of course. But they have really nice features that can be extended to real-life use cases like uh, the payments, uh, sharing content as well, monetizing content. So all these are part of the messaging culture and also part of the social platforms. So... <laughs> Cheers. Uh, so, what what do we give away when we when we use those kind of platforms? What do what what do we expose? Jaya, if you want to answer that one. Well, it it varies from platform to platform, right? But to pick up on the Telegram uh, thread, I think like many times people tend to um, like miss. Uh, interpret what goes on when people choose to use something like Telegram, for example, right? So I hear a lot of people say things like, oh, you know, end users don't really care about privacy, all they care about is convenience, right? Which, you know, I would actually fundamentally disagree with because um, sometimes if you ask a little bit of further questions, like I have friends of mine who'll be like, oh, but I think, isn't Telegram better for privacy than WhatsApp? Or isn't, you know, people invent all these different hypotheses and they're trying to work out what to use, right? Most people, they want to know what to use and they want to protect their privacy. It's just about making that information easily available and is easily accessible for people. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of a shameless plug here too. Uh, Nim, we have a kind of a cute little app called Nim Connect that actually privacy enhances Telegram. So it runs your Telegram traffic um, through the Nim Mixnet. Uh, it's absolutely in beta version. So it's, it's uh, in terms of usability, you know, it takes a little bit of, you know, you need to set your traffic to run through a SOX 5 proxy, this kind of thing. So we're not quite there yet, but it is there and it's available um, to use if you want to privacy enhance your, your Telegram app. Um, yeah. So, uh, so in terms of like, okay. So we're, we're if 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 we're exposing ourselves, or if 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 we're completely private, then um, how do we maintain a reputation 
as uh, you know, as a good, uh, an upstanding citizen, let's say, if we want to interact with a, a bank or a, a government, how do we do governance with with complete privacy? Uh, I th I think it's maybe it's not complete privacy, but it's it's more just it's a range, yeah. and that range is like in Web two has existed for a long time. So if you look at um, how you get your identity, it ranges from, they've got basically identity assurance levels, and that's basically like when you're issued an identity document of some description, what process have you gone through to get it? And that might be like a biometric scan, it might be someone checking your passport, and it might be like in physically in front of a, a, like a border agent or something answering questions. And that's like the far extreme of like how far you can go to like check someone out. But for a lot of interactions, like you don't need that at all. Like you just need to know, like, does this person, like, are they trustworthy? Do do I know that they have a social history that I get involved in? Like, a good example is, uh, like, a lot of our investors, like, they don't know each other. Like, they they've never met in person at all. Some of them are literally running on like just handles that they've known for like years, and yet I've heard stories of them being like. Yeah, yeah, I'll send you like whatever money you want for like a couple of days because you need to like clear a bill or something and just send me it back. And they're not operating on like any form of identity that Web2 would like recognize. But in Web3, it's just like it's completely natural. They're operating on a Telegram handle they've interacted with for five years. And so I think if you're shifting, like one of the things that we think will happen this year or maybe over the next few years is a shift from like needing to know identity, like we, what we would consider identity data, like names, passport numbers, all that kind of stuff, into a bit more like social proof, um, or at least like going into the data points that you care about. Like to get a parcel to your front door, you don't really need someone's name, you just need their address. Um, and so you can start massively cutting down on the data that you need. And it's also bringing it in from other places. Like, if you look historically, you would have got that data inside a village from just social proofs. It would have been like, yeah, I know that person. I know how they like. They always pay their bills, or they typically. And so you you would give them credit, like you would barter with them. And I think it's going to almost head back that way. It's like we don't need to have this massive surveillance society to do this. We can just go for what we need. And that's kind of one of the principles of self-sovereign ID or decentralized ID is um, like minimum disclosure. It's like, what do you actually need for this interaction and get rid of everything else? And therefore, you don't, don't leak as much, certainly on like the actual data. But then, I guess, to, to Jaya's point, like, you're still, there's still the metadata side that sits underneath that that you probably still are exposing. I mean, I, personally, I think like, there, is a, there tends to be this like, weird um, misunderstanding of like, like, privacy and surveillance or like, visibility and invisibility as if it's kind of too completely like a black and white binary, right? Um, it's, it's not a binary and it's not even like a grayscale. It's actually like a really complex field of actors where, that, where the question, the more relevant question to ask is what's visible to whom and under what conditions, right? Um, and in fact, like I think now we have got some incredibly sophisticated tools um, for shaping those kinds of relations. And I'm talking about, you know, the full stack, right? I'm talking about, you know, of course, the NIMIXnet, you know, but I'm also talking about, you know, uh, very clever use of zero knowledge proofs. Um, we actually have, uh, you know, the, w the way to think about it is um, tools to shape, you know, the digital space in incredible new ways. And, and here I mean, you know, in ways that actually operate differently than the physical world. Because when we're talking about zero knowledge proofs and the ability to prove something without revealing the underlying data, you know, we're in the world of mass, right? We're in a different kind of scenario. And we haven't actually, like, there's, there's a whole uh, load of conversations that need to be had um, about what that means for society before we even get to kind of building some of these more sophisticated architectures. And so, you know, I think, um, I think there's work to do in terms of the understanding of privacy um, I using both analogies from the real world um, but also saying, you know, the, fi the digital world actually just works quite differently. So we need to, we need to start developing kind of new analogies there too. Um, uh, and, and trying to kind of map out, you know, this question of what's revealed to, to whom and under what condition. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, this is a topic that I think is really important and I think we could do a whole panel just on, on this. I, th I think the issue is that everybody wants an easy life. Like, people are used to the, the messaging app that they've got now, but they don't consider the implications of, of using something like that or, you know, their, their banking app, all that kind of stuff. So how do we make it 
easier for people to... Well, it's not very easy right now, right? <laughs> yeah, like exactly. it's actually really annoying. Like the experience hard. of using the internet right now is probably worse than it's ever been in the sense yeah. that like the amount of logins that you have to do, the amount of like legal documents that's attached to every single web page that you visit, the, the situation that we're in right now is practically like crazy, you know? And I think that's like we need to start solving that. Like the idea that things are very usable now and if we add more privacy it's going to become less usable. Like it's actually the the inverse is is, is true. Yeah. The more privacy we have, the less of all this other bullshit that we need to deal with. Because, like, you know, if you don't, if you're not uh, creating uh, sensitive data in the first place, you don't, you don't have to deal with that problem, right? So it's this idea of like, if you have privacy by default, like the less data, the better, right? It's like you don't have to worry about GDPR, GDPR compliance, all this other bullshit, because you do not have the data, right? Is you just, you just have a website, and people can read what's on it. That, that's it, right? Yeah, and, and to build upon that, there was a great point from um, the guy from Protocol Labs that builds Filecoin, and he was like, you almost need a Trojan horse where the UX is like fucking super shiny, yeah. but underneath everything just works like flawlessly. Like, th I think looking across all of us, it would be, it is technically feasible to build something like LastPass or 1Password or like Chrome Autofill and do it entirely privacy preserving. So it's filling in a fake name if you need to give your address, it gives the real one. It maybe gives a tokenized credit card, and that's it. And otherwise, it's not giving anything. And that's entirely feasible and doable as a product. It just needs doing and then rolling out. So I think that's going to be the fun bit of like the next two years is the tech starting to get there. It just needs implementing into like really shit hot products, and that's yeah. going to be the really fun stuff. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think then we're going to start to see a basically a shift in the entire innovation pathway, right? Away from one that's surveillance driven towards something that, that looks radically different. I mean, a different type of digital economy. Another thing that I want to quickly add is about the, actually everything around the internet is governed by email. And the so-called email can be replaced with so many tools. First, like the most easiest one is a wallet address. Like, of course the wallet address can be identified, et cetera, later on if you are interacting, but like, Email have been around for 30 years. It's been governing our so-called sign-ups, registrations, following up uh, logins. So I think this is where basically the first step will occur in the near future, that the email will be swifting to something else. And that solution will be more private, more anti-spam, and definitely more secure towards the user side. So that's something that I'm super really interested from author side as well. Yeah, I think um, just from um, delivering workshops to people, the, the hardest bit to get through often, and it takes like an hour, is just setting up a seed phrase and a wallet. Like if you ever tried to onboard an artist to do to mint NFTs like in person, it, it takes so long. I feel I feel like we need to remove all of that crap from the from the user experience, basically. I actually have thought about this. Um there's a possibility actually to use a picture-based encryption. So basically, instead of like having your um, um, seed phrase written down, you just incorporate everything inside like a, a like a JPEG, right? So like a picture, and this picture is like your private key to your access of your wallet. So that means it would be taking around three clicks to create your wallet. One click is to create, uh, generate the image download it and it can be I don't know a kitty cat on your desktop wallet right who will understand that this is like a private key well there's one character that always will give out is the size of the picture because it will be um, around 12 to 20 megabytes worth of uh, file size but that's the only like differentiation from the uh, uh, just a regular picture so this is actually another way how we can uh, improve the experience so just that's really like I'd, I'd heard of the technique before. But I'd never thought about using it in a in a login or securing experience because it is just clunky. And like it's why so many wallets at the moment are defaulting to like Gmail login and like other equivalents because it's just easy. And it's and it's not it's not just it's not just user experience, but it's developer experience as well, which I'd imagine all of us have like tried to optimize for because just. Not only is using te like privacy tech hard, like developing it is even harder, especially developing on top of it. Um, so just making that user experience as easy as possible. Like there's a reason why people use things like Facebook and Google login, and it's because they've got it down to one line of code. Yeah. It's super, super quick. 
Um, so if you're a developer and you want something that will, you know will work for a lot of users around the world and it will not take you more than five minutes to implement, you just chuck it in. And it needs to get to that simplicity where people will start adopting it because it's equivalent but better. Yeah, I think, um, I think people either if it's a picture or if it's a fingerprint that, that, that gets you in, it's, it's, it's always the most difficult bit about teaching uh, people that aren't crypto native, um, how to how to get involved is always the the seed phrase, the wallet. I actually remember my previous experience in banking when the so-called internet bank age started. We needed to onboard people there, so we needed to explain everybody like grandmothers, everything else like, what is this tool? You have the call calculator. You need to go inside of the internet. So it took a time. It's the same with wallets now. It will just take time. Um, okay, so uh, so okay, so let's talk about um, let's talk about metadata now. So like we have this um, we have this map of um, of interactions between between different parties, and if you have enough uh, computational power or enough enough um, you know enough resources, you can watch everything. So how how do your various projects like um, obfuscate that information and make it difficult to, for the, the viewer? I think that was directed to me, no? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is, this is uh, your well, uh, I mean, like I explained, you know, NIM, NIM is, is a mixed net, right? So, and when we're talking about metadata, when we're talking about metadata surveillance, we're talking about not just the patterns of communication, but also things like the size of the packets, the time that it's sent, all that kind of stuff, which exactly, yeah. essentially you know, can, can de-anonymize you pretty easily. Um, uh, and not only that, it can also tell you a lot about the relationship between you know, who's talking to who, is, are they likely to be business associates, are they li likely to be lovers, right, depending on what time of the day they yeah, tend yeah. to talk to each other, all I, this kind of I stuff. I like to visualize it like a detective uh, map basically. Yeah. You know, you're like, who's he, you're talking to him at that point? Like, blah, yeah. blah, blah, You know, with all the strings. I, yep. To give a to give a really quick example from today, I was speaking to a guy who does like in-depth cybersecurity like analysis, like basically network analysis of people. And the one he was looking at was basically people running. It was a far right. It was a group of far right groups, and they're using crypto scams to like raise funds. And then he was basically followed it all the way down to a, like an individual he could find. Yeah. All using like domain registries, stuff like LinkedIn, and just basically mapping it all together. And that's without even getting to metadata, where you're leaking it just all over the place. Like this is using publicly available data sources, and in this case, it's being used for good. But like you could quite easily go the other way and tear someone's life apart with it. So it's, yeah, it's just so easy to follow it around. Yeah, I think it's going to become uh, maybe a bigger problem when, when you know, all this, all this stuff takes off and people, you already see people doing governance capture methods and, and well, it, strategies, yeah. I think the easiest way of putting it is like, <laughs> like, whichever side you're on, it's always cat and mouse. You're always trying to develop something and then the next side is catching up. Whether that's like encryption versus surveillance, or whether that's what these what is going on with these guys, where you've got fraudsters versus like a forensic like an analyst, they're both just playing cat and mouse, and it's going to continue pretty much forever. And I think I'd hope that we're on the right side of where we're going um, on the stage. Um, I, and I think I guess to round it off, I don't know if this was going to be your closing remarks, but like it, there's been a bit of a narrative shift, like. If you were here last year, like, I think 50% of this was probably NFTs. And now, like, I think there were si there's like 67 sessions. There are like six sessions purely on privacy, about four on data, and a load more on trust. And half of the ones I've been to have been on those, like they've talked about those topics all the way through. So I, I think it's just, there's a massive narrative shift that we're, I think, yeah. really on the right side of. I agree, and I think I think the narrative shift is partially driven by um, people suddenly realizing that privacy is actually closely related to security, not just of people, but also of the systems that you're building, um, and that it also, because of that, relates directly to value, right? So people are starting to kind of really see what is the effect of, of uh, lack of privacy or, or kind of leaks, data leaks. 
Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think, I think we've only just started to see the beginning. I think privacy is going to be a huge theme for the next year, if not the theme. And we're going to start, uh, start to see it play out, and many of these debates play out in, in some of the kind of much bigger topics, especially when it comes to things like CBDCs and privacy and payments yeah. and, and this kind of thing. So, um, so, yeah, this is just the beginning, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think, um, and thank you guys for, uh, for 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 the lovely talk. But I think the 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 vibe is like it's a combination of different methods. It's not just going to be one. At the end of the day, it's got it has to be uh, different encryption methods, different forms of communication like alter, or different mix nets, and um, and checked as well for I identity protection. You know, it's. It ha we have to combine all these uh, these these strategies together to achieve the solution that we want, and um, yeah, I think that's that's the path we're all on. So thank you, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming. Thank you, especially on the Friday.